Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the National Environmental Health Association's uh, webinar. This is Comprehensive Disaster Assessment and Readiness Toolkit. We're pleased to be able to present this as part of NEHA's Preparedness Committee. This webinar, we're gonna be learning a little bit about a suite of scenario-based and act-based surveys and tools that can help standardize how to evaluate if public health and healthcare facilities are prepared for an emergency. So again, this webinar is hosted by the NEHA Preparedness Committee. It is my pleasure to introduce you to and to turn over this presentation to Lieutenant Commander Kai Elgatun. He's the Regional Director of ATSDR Region 8. So Kai, welcome. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, we're really excited. This is the inaugural NEHA Preparedness Committee webinar, and we are excited to do this from now on, once a quarter. I am the chair of the NEHA Preparedness Committee, and I'd like to introduce to you today um, two of my colleagues from ATSDR. We have Kelsey Brady, who is an epidemiologist at our headquarters in Atlanta, and Chris Poulet, who is a regional representative in Region 8 in Denver. And I will turn it over to them now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kai. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to be here and to present uh, at this, uh, this first quarterly preparedness webinar for NEHA. So it's, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Thanks very much. Um, so this will be an overview presentation of, of uh, ATSDR CDART toolkit. Um, and we'll um, basically, the, the toolkit that we're going to talk about today began <laughs> back in 2017 uh, with um, an Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response for Health and Human Services Incident Response Coordination Team Task Order during the Hurricane Maria response to assess needs at Puerto Rico hospitals and clinics. Um, further development of the toolkit throughout the Hurricane Maria occurred throughout the Hurricane Maria recovery, as well as during the pandemic and is ongoing currently. Uh, Kelsey, I'll go ahead and say next slide. Um, thanks. So um, basically, in a response, we need an efficient and consistent way to collect, visualize, and analyze data. Some of the questions we need to ask ourselves are, are shown here in this slide. Um, in a response, how can we collect and enter data? How do we manage it? How do we view it? And how can we use it? And so in this presentation today, we're going to address some of these questions. Um, so uh, basically, I'll begin by providing a little bit of background. I'm sure you all are familiar with uh, Hurricane, uh, Hurricane Maria, but uh, we, since this started in 2017, right after the response began, after the hurricane hit Puerto Rico, I'll just give a little bit of background. And everything started with facility, uh, healthcare facility assessments um, that were tasked to us by the IRCT3 um, uh, during the response. So on September 28th, at the request of the Puerto Rico Department of Health and the federal health coordinating official, the public health field teams under the public health branch of the IRCT3 began assessments of a subset of hospitals on the island. And approximately a week later, a subset of clinics were assessed as well. The assessment tools contained various queries, including operational unit capabilities, bed census, structural and facility damage, and specific facility needs. Next slide. Um, in the absence of geospatial and immediate online mapping capabilities, the team developed a very simple but effective star tracking system on this paper map that you see here, which worked uh, remarkably well for the, for the three field teams that were conducting assessments each day at the time. Um, later, uh, as the task order added more and more assessments that began to require multiple field teams uh, to be you know, throughout the island of Puerto Rico every day, it became much more complicated. Next slide. Initial assessments were conducted on a subset of health care facilities across the island. After completion of the first phase of assessments, the federal health coordinating official requested additional clinic and hospital assessments based on a tiered approach. A list of tier one and tier two hospitals was distributed uh, to the teams. The priority list was based on population density, proximity to other healthcare facilities and other factors. Additionally, a, a list of tier three clinics was distributed for priority assessments. After completion of the priority hospital and clinics, uh, the team completed assessments of all hospitals and 186 clinics in Puerto Rico. 
The information was provided to FEMA, to HHS, and to the Puerto Rico Department of Health on a daily basis. Additional strategy meetings were held twice, uh, at least twice a day with FEMA, the Puerto Rico Department of Health, and Health and Human Services leadership, um, as well as uh, briefings provided daily to senior Department of Defense officials in the field. The information from these assessments was used for a variety of efforts uh, during the response, including strategic planning for Department of Defense medical treatment facilities, temporary repairs, and prioritization of where those repairs should occur and submission of public assistance requests for repairs. Next slide. Um, here you can see the, uh, the a map of the uh, from the hospitals that were assessed in Puerto Rico, 64 of them from September to November, 2017. And of course the red line marks the path of the hurricane across the island. And as you can see in the interior, um, healthcare facilities are, are less well represented um, in the interior of the island. Um, next slide, Kelsey, thanks. And then this slide shows um, the uh, healthcare uh, centers, so clinics and so forth that were assessed throughout the island as well from October, to November 2017. Um, there were actually 193 assessments performed on a total of 186 healthcare centers, and that's because we had to assess some of them twice based on a need for updated information. Next slide. Um, so the initial uh, hospital and clinic assessment tools uh, contained questions. First of all, they were on paper, as you can see here. So um, something that uh, can become very cumbersome, especially when you're in the field with clipboards and everything. Um, but they contain questions regarding facility damage, unit level operational status, facility needs uh, or shortages, communication status, uh, power and water status as well. Um, the hospital assessment tool contained additional questions on dialysis patient numbers, patient surge and patient census, while the clinic assessment tool contained questions on oxygen supply and needs and patient treatment numbers along with hospital referral information. The assessments also requested information on ward capacity and the number of deceased being held in the wards. So now to move on to uh, when you're doing assessments in the field, um, you know, you have to think of data entry requirements, right? And so in this case, there were numerous follow-up items to be completed at the end of the day with the paper surveys. The field assessment forms had to be rewritten at the end of the day, requiring an estimated 15 additional minutes. The data uh, was entered into the database, which on average took about 30 minutes, and the data entry was QAQC, which took approximately 15 minutes. This resulted in approximately one hour of staff time per assessment, with six teams completing between two to four assessments per day, six days a week. This added up to approximately 72 hours uh, per week, actually, of, uh, of time taken to do just those tasks. In addition to uh, the large amount of staff time used, manual data entry is also subject to errors. And actually to do this, we actually timed a subset of, of um, paper surveys and the process that went from you know, the arrival of the survey uh, in, the, um, in the public health branches offices in the Puerto Rico um, Convention Center to the time that they were entered into the database and QAQC. So we could actually sort of guesstimate how much this, uh, how much this, this process took. Next slide. Um, so during the response, the branch leadership noticed this length of time, uh, an effort that was required for entry of the hospital and clinic assessment data into usable database. In order to reduce the burden of data entry and increase the quality of the data, the branch leadership collaborated with the Puerto Rico Junta de Planificación GIS group, and that's the Puerto Rico Planning Board's GIS group, which was based in the Joint Operations Center in the uh, Convention Center, in order to, to develop an application which would incorporate the hospital and clinic assessment tools. The app application-based data collection was piloted from October 31st through November 18th on 76 clinics, about 42% of the total that were tasked to the public health branch, and allowed this, this uh, approach allowed for immediate data collection and data entry in the field. It eliminated the need for separate data entry along with the QA, QC of data entry as well. Additionally, field assessors can upload if necessary, they can upload, they could upload photos uh, directly to the site-specific survey. The Puerto Rico Planning Board also worked to develop a dashboard for each tool which showed real-time information on hospitals, clinics, um, specifically on high level information needs such as power status, communication status, water supply, and operational capacity. 
Um, the applications used were ESRI's um, ArcGIS Online, Survey123 Connect, georeferenced electronic forms. So that's uh, the, 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 um, the, we didn't just arrive with all these tools there. And when we realized that we could try to make the process more efficient in order to collect the um, healthcare facility assessment uh, data that was required by um, ASPERS uh, IRCT, we had to look for number one, tablets, because we didn't have any. So FEMA Logistics actually provided 10 tablets. They were, they were available, which was really nice. We had our um, ATSDR uh, geospatial programs uh, support in this as well. And we had the support of G the GIS services based in the uh, Joint Operations Center, as I mentioned, the Puerto Rico Planning Board, which was actually providing a large part of that support at that time. So next slide. So now we'll move on a little bit to the development of the CDART tool in, on the preparedness side. And this occurred during the, uh, the uh, uh, recovery process uh, after Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. Next slide. Um, during the recovery activities in 2018 in Puerto Rico, CDART received a request from the Health and Social Services Recovery Support Function um, uh, to further develop the CDART tools in electronic forms in Survey123 in the Survey123 Connect application based on the work that we had done during the hurricane response. We worked with the uh, Puerto Rico Department of Health and the Department of Family to create readiness and disaster assessments for healthcare and elder care facilities. This involved creating visual dashboards, piloting tools, creating training manuals in Spanish and English, and training staff over the, over the next year. Next slide. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about the data workflow here, so you can see how this process works. I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with how, um, you know, Survey123 um, and other tools um, in ArcGIS Online uh, work. But basically, to summarize, you have your paper survey on the far left that you convert into an electronic survey form using the Survey123 Connect application for use on tablets, cell phones, or laptops. This feeds into an Excel file with all of the data and can populate visual dashboards that you create based on information needed by the requester. So the surveys can be uploaded to the cloud as soon as you have an internet connection, and they're also stored within the Survey123 uh, application on the electronic device. Next slide. As part of this work uh, with the Puerto Rico Department of Health, uh, the CDART team developed a readiness check and a status check to be administered 48 hours before a known disaster, and two post-disaster assessment tools that could be administered less than 72 hours after the event. including This included a rapid disaster assessment tool given to facilities and a more in-depth comprehensive disaster assessment tool. The rapid tool can be given to all non-priority facilities and can determine which facilities would need a more in-depth comprehensive assessment. The comprehensive assessment tool can be given to all priority facilities initially, um, we also trained the Puerto Rico Department of Health's hospital coalition members on using the CDART tool in a trained trainer approach. So in Puerto Rico. Next slide. Uh, this, this is an example uh, of a visual dashboard that we created for PRDOH showing readiness status of hospitals and clinics. The shapes designate facility type and the color indicates readiness status based on an algorithm uh, developed that, was, that included backup water supplies, uh, backup communications, and generator status. CDART developed the algorithm uh, for this red, yellow, green operational status using ESRI's arcade programming language um, in ArcGIS Online uh, and dashboard operations, which is a tool that you can use to build dashboards. Next slide. Uh, so these screenshots show uh, a, a project that was started with the uh, Puerto Rico Department of Families, um, and they show a status check for elder care and senior living facilities. These surveys were created in both English and Spanish and includes questions like facility status, capacity enrollment and vacancies, special conditions and uh, medications of patients, generator status, and other criteria. Next slide. Um, here is uh, similarly, uh, the CDART team was asked to create visual dashboards for the Department of Family, including three types of elder care and senior living facilities, denoted as institución, um, campea, and sustituto. These are the requirements of the Department of the Families. 
As the Department of the Family requested, we use colors for facility status, which is coded at which were coded as open, partially open, closed, or partially closed based on their request. Next slide. Um, importantly, using these dashboards, uh, the CDART team with its, its toolkit can show uh, those facilities that reported having a resident that requires dialysis treatment. So as you can see on this, this um, on the map, as well as the dashboard, uh, this is represented by purple stars. It's extremely important to be able to show this as there were issues um, with dialysis access uh, after Hurricane Maria. Next slide. Now we can talk just briefly about data integration using different layers uh, that are collected by uh, different uh, assessment tools. Um, it's easy to integrate other data, including Puerto Rico Department of Health as healthcare readiness status for hospitals and clinics. Um, in this map, you can see where there's an elder care and senior living facility with a resident that requires dialysis and the nearest working dialysis clinic uh, or hospital. This way we can shift patients uh, or patients could be shifted from an elder care and senior living facility to the closest working dialysis center and can also pull in post disaster data from uh, other types of assessments. Next slide. Again, talking a little bit about data integration with this platform, we can also add predefined filters to the map as well as the capability to add other types of public or shared data, including waterways, current road status from the Department of Transportation uh, in Puerto Rico, school, stat, uh, school locations, US hospitalization rates, uh, FEMA data, or other types of data. Data can be integrated uh, online, or you could easily pull, uh, you can pull the layers off of ArcGIS Online and use them uh, in a standalone um, uh, copy of ArcGIS Pro or ArcGIS Map or ArcMap. So, okay, with that, we'll go on to uh, other, um, uh, other refinements and developments of the CDART tool, most notably during the pandemic. Uh, for vaccine distribution dashboards. And Kelsey will now talk about uh, a request from the Puerto Rico Department of Health uh, back in two, late 2020. Kelsey? Thanks, Chris. I'm going to go move on to the next slide. Um, so the CDART team received a direct request in late 2020, as Chris mentioned, from the lead emergency coordinator for ASPO Region 2 to provide vaccine logistics and distribution support to uh, PRDOH, the Puerto Rico Department of Health, um, which the task order and the funds came from ASPR in this case. And so uh, we as the CDART team created various data entry forms and a visual dashboard to help track the vaccine distribution across the island. And so the facilities and response were operating on um, what's called a hub and spoke model and so the National Guard was transporting some of the vaccines from a main, um, most likely a larger hub facility to some of the smaller spoke, spoke facilities. Um, and so we developed these tracking forms to be filled out on phones and tablets, as well as on computers or laptops, just for ease. And as long as there is a stable internet connection, um, the data can be sent in real time to the dashboard and the database. And we added in data for um, various population types, um, especially those who were essentially considered high risk at the time, and also added the capability. Um, the software and development allowed PRDOH to edit for different phases of vaccine distribution, especially at this time, um, I think, uh, J and J came later, you know, they were distributing um, Pfizer and they all had different temperature requirements. So it was important to keep track of what type of vaccine and then what phase um, you were in as well. So similarly to what Chris showed before in the presentation, this is the data workflow. And so on the left, you can see the um, a screenshot of an electronic data entry form, which was used to collect the vaccine distribution information, um, mostly done in the field during transport. Um, and this feeds into the database, as you can see, um, which can be exported and shared as an Excel file. And then once you create a dashboard, as shown in the bottom right screenshot, um, the data will automatically populate and change in near real time, um, which is critical for vaccine information needs. And we added in questions for users and transporters to, um, you can see down here, take a picture of the ID number of the vaccine boxes just to confirm 
um, added in questions on the type manufacturer, as well as the facility names and locations to double check those, um, as well as the temperature. Uh, moving from COVID-19 work, uh, we've also been discussing the use of CDART for other disaster scenarios. And these could range from um, wildfires, flooding, mudslides, earthquakes, tsunamis, ice storms, and more. I think there's really endless possibilities. Um, but what's really great about using the Esri software product is that you can track your teams in the field um, and then do quick assessments of an area if possible for preparedness before a known disaster like a hurricane to anticipate those facility um, or community needs and then send this information to a variety of partners, which could be, um, as we all know, in a response, state, federal, private, um, there's so many entities involved. It's really important to be able to get on the same page and share information quickly. Um, and then if you're not able to do this before a disaster, using these tools right after can also allow for information flow quickly, um, especially for emergency responders and as you start to um, shift around supplies. To summarize the benefits of uh, CDAR and using this Esri Web GIS platform, we found that real-time data entry, um, as Chris mentioned before, eliminates manual data entry, which is extremely important, and no one wants to do manual data entry in the field, especially when they're tired working on a response and they've spent uh, many hours working. It's just uh, really strenuous. So we've also seen less errors um, when data collection forms are standardized and put onto Survey123 versus having to transcribe different handwritings um, and then just adding in another layer of data entry from paper to electronic. You also uh, immediately have access to available data after a survey uploads in an organized database, which allows for you to see or share the data um, or even select parts of the data with partners and visual dashboards. And we think this is really critical, especially for preparedness and response, but um, so leadership and various partners can see uh, parts of the data that you wanna share with them. Um, it just streamlines the entire effort. You can also create um, what's called an internal ArcGIS hub or enterprise site to manage and integrate all of your assessment information collected uh, before or during a response. And so um, this was done previously for some of the state health departments during COVID. I know if you look on the Esri website, they have a lot of examples of what they're calling um, like the COVID-19 hubs or um, enterprise sites, which a lot of them, they can either be internal to just partners or you can make them public facing and allow community to access them. Um, but it's, you can really incorporate all of the Esri GIS tools on those sites fairly easily, um, as well as the different softwares. So it's a great tool. Um, if you haven't heard of it, we'd be happy to talk uh, further in depth about that as well. And then as forms and data are sent in during a response, you can track field team locations and then increase situational awareness, which is obviously critical um, in a disaster response. For CDART, we've had um, some successes, some opportunities, some limitations and challenges, which is to be expected. Um, for successes, we have had interagency collaborations and support from partners, including FEMA and HHS ASPR. Um, we've worked really extensively with Puerto Rico, which has been fantastic. Um, we piloted CDART in preparation for Hurricane Barry uh, in 2018, and we've also had various calls, uh, technical assistance, as well to health departments around the country. And the limitations and challenges that we've come across so far, um, a major one includes data sharing challenges and then getting agencies to agree upon data integration um, ahead of a disaster, so in the preparedness phase. You know, you might need um, some sort of document stating uh, what fields you're willing to share, what data you're collecting. But I, we think this is um, really good ahead of a disaster just to get all that done in advance is can really streamline data collection and data sharing. Um, easier said than done, but we also wanna note that the 
accuracy of geolocations of facilities um, need to be confirmed ahead of time, especially during a preparedness phase. So all of the locations are correct when you are sending out field teams, as well as um, even just mapping and sharing with partners and or the public. It's really imperative to get those locations correct. Um, and then to use the CDART tools, the users need at least one overall ArcGIS license, um, which Esri provides a variety of types and at different price points. Um, some of the licenses obviously can do more and then you have access to different types of software, while others may just be um, someone in the field just entering in data and accessing the data after. And so it's important to look at the different types of um, licenses and um, Esri technology also changes uh, frequently. Um, so keeping up with the newest version and seeing what other um, kind of add-ons they have available is also really helpful and um, could be a challenge if you're uh, not using the latest version of certain things. Okay, so moving into where we are going now with CDART, we have some really exciting things coming up in the next year. So currently we have integrated some of the assessment tools onto CDC's Phoenix platform. And this is the Public Health Operations for Emergency Information Integration and Exchange System. We love our acronyms website. Um, I'll explain a little bit about Phoenix on the next slide as it is fairly new to CDC and right now just is internal only. Um, we'd also like to continue to partner with SCLT partners to develop our, their, our tools um, to meet their needs um, and help them if they'd like to develop their own tools. Uh, and then a big one is we are starting to develop a, what we're calling a questionnaire data bank or QDB that is basically a scenario-based data bank with vetted questions based on input from appropriate um, federal or state partner agencies. And these will include HHS ASPR, uh, EPA, FEMA, as well as state health departments. So I will also talk about that a bit more in depth since that's a big endeavor um, that we're taking on. Um, and then just continue to train partners on the tools and usage as well. So a bit more on Phoenix for clarification. Um, it is basically its own internal website that uses Esri GIS technology to hold various um, emergency response tools, data, dashboards for ATSDR and CDC right now. And as I mentioned, it is internal only at this point, but I know the goal is to give state and federal partners access to parts of it in the future. And we recently talked to the leads of this um, and they were able to test external access uh, pretty recently. So we believe it's coming shortly for others to have broader access to the tools located on Phoenix. Um, and then as noted on the slide, Phoenix came out of the 2017 hurricane season funding. Um, that included responses to Harvey, Irma, Maria, um, as we all know, and funding was provided to CDC and ATSDR to develop this application, which contains preparedness response and recovery tools all in one easy um, access point. And so there, just kind of to wrap this up, there really has been a larger push at ATSDR and CDC to streamline data collection and have emergency response tools readily available for deployers to use. And I think something we've seen in the past is that um, there hasn't been like a one-stop shop for a lot of these tools. And you're really pulling from a bunch of different locations. And you know the intent is to make it easy and readily available maybe before you deploy, um, as well as for preparedness efforts. Uh, I think I covered some of this on the previous slide, but all of the tools and data on Phoenix are housed on secure CDC servers. So it makes data collection and sharing secure as well with um, private or um, public entities. And right now, Phoenix has a variety of data sets, and these include sociodemographic, environmental, infrastructural, as well as um, active data feeds. So you can use like a REST link or you can link a database from partner agencies. Um, this is especially used for um, emergency responses. Um, and so the, the goal really is to have a robust data warehouse of tools for staff um, and allowing 
uh, the platform to hold CDC emergency response data while allowing partners to access it. Uh, this is a quick screenshot of the homepage of Phoenix. Um, it kind of explains a couple things below the, uh, or sorry, above these four circles. Um, it includes sections on uh, modules that you can access, all of the various tools, allows you to explore um, the data included, which includes, you know, some public facing FEMA data, some ASPR data, um, things that have previously been published for responses. And they have um, some videos and documents that um, you can use uh, for training efforts. Uh, this is a screenshot of how some of the CDART tools on Phoenix look right now. And so this includes the CDART Healthcare Readiness Check, the Comprehensive Assessment, and the um, Healthcare Facilities Rapid Assessment. And so eventually we will put the QDB onto Phoenix once that's complete as well and allow people to access that. Uh, just two more screenshots um, kind of to explain a little bit from where we came from with the Puerto Rico work to now is that, you know, the, the Puerto Rico work was very specific to the facilities that were across the island. And so to make this a little bit more generic and usable for other health departments and responders, um, we created these generic versions of the readiness check, rapid and comprehensive assessment. And so previously we had a predefined list of facilities and so hospitals, clinics, dialysis centers, et cetera, um, entered. So you can just start you know, typing the name in the facility name box right here, and then it will pull up the facility along with the address and geospatial location automatically. And of course, this is preferred to save time, ensure accuracy, um, eliminate data entry errors, but if you don't have a list of the facilities that you're going out to assess, um, we created these generic versions. So they just are text boxes that you can enter in the name and address, which once, once, you, give, um, once you give some sort of geospatial component like an address, zip code, um, it'll start to uh, map it for you. So um, it'll automatically display the location as well. Um, but note, it is possible if you had a list of facilities that you were going out to assess or even for preparedness efforts, getting this information from, um, it's possible to import that and have it automatically do it as well. So we are currently offering these versions to state partners. Um, they can also use these as a guide to create their own versions or request technical assistance to tailor the surveys to their needs. Um, a little bit more on the questionnaire data bank. We are currently holding internal meetings with a variety of staff with experience in emergency response, as well as field assessments to develop the priority scenarios and questions. Um, and mainly our focus is uh, what ATSDR and CDC teams could be tasked with in the field. And so for each um, scenario, such as hurricanes, flooding, earthquakes, tsunamis, um, and sometimes a combination of those, we're looking at what questions are key for a field team and what would fall under each category. And so these would likely include preparedness and damage assessments for facilities like hospitals, clinics, dialysis centers, um, senior living facilities, schools, shelters, mass feeding sites, uh, and local health departments. We really want a, um, a wide variety since CDC responders do end up assessing these, as well as we want to make you know, tools useful for our partners. Uh, and the information included may entail um, basic damage assessment, water capacity needs, sanitation needs, indoor air quality, um, especially chemical awareness and more. So this is a project we will be working on for the next year and we will be able to pull in external partners for their expertise and advice in the coming months, which we're really excited about. Um, we've also looked at the as a side note, the FEMA GIS page, um, HHS Empower, Ask for GeoHealth, and the um, NIEHS DR2 program. So as not to duplicate efforts, but to find a gap in what is out there for responders and then make that available to all. 
And we feel really strongly about using the Esri GIS software to develop this QDBE because, you know, as shown on um, some of these other pages, websites, and with uh, other agencies, as well as state health departments, um, they already use it or they have GIS units or at least or at least one staff member with a GIS with GIS experience. Um, so information can easily flow in a disaster and you already have people that have that expertise um, across various entities. And we also intend to train ATSCR and CEH staff on the QDB as well as uh, various techniques for conducting assessments in the field to have a rapidly deployable assessment team as a tool. Uh, as a tool itself. And uh, this is sometimes hard to get people to deploy, to be ready to be ready to deploy quickly and to have the skills needed. So to provide that training beforehand and really train them on the tools as well as give them the knowledge on how to tweak the tools kind of on the fly in the field using these applications, I think we think will be really helpful. Um, and I, as Chris mentioned, we already also have a large group um, GIS group at CDC called GRASS, and they provide technical assistance during emergencies, and they would also be able to step in and assist as well. Uh, we just wanted to show our public-facing website. We have a couple fact sheets on there in English and Spanish. A lot is um, specific to the work in Puerto Rico, but we will be adding more on this website soon. Um, the, we don't have information on the QDB just yet, but eventually we will have that on there as well. We also wanted to highlight some other uses of the other public health uses of this platform in case you're interested. Um, another project that Chris and I both work on is called CCARIT. It's our cancer cluster and regional activity tracker. Um, this is an internal only kind of website that we're using the ATSCR that tracks cancer cluster inquiries that we receive as an agency. Um, and these mostly come from state health departments or concerned citizens across the country. And we've also used the same ESRI GIS tools, similar to CDART for um, exposure assessments in the field. Uh, when we have an example, we can go through. Uh, these are screenshots of CCARIT. Um, basically, it's an internal website using GIS survey forms, uh, dashboards, and databases. It includes the public site-related documents that we produce as an agency, like public health assessments, health consultations, as well as exposure investigations. And so we have those mapped, um, and then we also have the cancer cluster inquiries that we receive mapped at the county level. Um, so users, which are just ATSCR staff right now, can search and view all of the cancer cluster inquiries across the nation by type of cancer, um, commu other community concerns, contaminant type, exposure medium, um, and really see what we have done in the past in an area, uh, which is extremely helpful when we get a cancer inquiry, especially as we get new staff. Um, we sometimes see with some communities, they had cancer concerns maybe 10 years ago, and we went out as an agency and conducted, you know, a listening session, and we want to know that if there's still cancer concerns or the same, if there's a cancer cluster inquiry um, in that same area, you know, what has been done as well as an agency. So, uh, we have integrated Power BI software into CCARIT, and these are just two examples. It's not the real data, um, but the CCARIT team can update these periodically with new information, which makes it easier for staff and leadership to not only just download the data in Excel um, and have readily available, but have readily available visualizations that they can use um, to make decisions. And so if you're not familiar, we use Power BI. I know there's other, other um, similar software uh, like Tableau but we have access to Power BI at CDC ATSCR. So it is interactive. So you can click on like these pie charts, um, some of the tabs below for various ATSCR regions. Um, it makes it easier uh, for you to quickly see key statistics like um, for each ATSCR region, how many documents have been produced um, at that year or a specific year 
or you can know the total amount of cancer cluster inquiries that we've received. So key statistics like that. For a PFAS exposure assessment, um, we worked with the CDC geospatial group GRASS. They provided user logins and recruitment area map tiles, uh, and we used Survey123 and Workforce uh, software. Um, this EA was done in Colorado, and we worked with the ATSDR Region 8 as well as uh, ATSDR headquarters staff. And the goal of this is that we were trying to bolster recruitment for a PFAS exposure assessment. So we were going door to door to discuss the study with community members, um, see if they were interested, though we were not collecting any PII at that time. Um, and just to note, the area was very large, um, fairly rural. So the leads divided the area into three different zones. Um, and we split up into teams of two and visited about 2,600 homes in four days. So it was quite a lot of work, but um, great to do it in the field. Uh, we use tablets and smartphones, um, and then Workforce allows you, this is the Workforce uh, logo, if you're not familiar, it allows you to click on each home um, and then kind of click like start the assessment, which opens up your survey. Uh, which had information about the EA study that was being conducted and if the participant was interested or no longer wanted to be contacted. And it worked out really well. We were able to tell, test both online and offline capabilities in the field, which was great um, because sometimes you just don't have access or service. And so you need to be able to make it work offline. I think this about wraps up our presentation. Uh, we quickly wanted to acknowledge all of our partners and colleagues for the help with um, various CDART projects. It's really been um, an endeavor and especially working with our territorial and state partners has been great. So I think with that, we can take any questions. Mm -hmm. Unless Chris, you wanna add anything? No, no, we do have some questions in the chat already. So I've been kind of looking at them. So I don't know if you want me to sort of begin okay. those or how you want to go about doing that? So I'm looking, it doesn't matter to me, it's up to you. Yeah, I'm looking at the first question here. It says, um, were paper surveys uh, used to do uh, used due to the lack of uh, cell phone service, I believe, or data service during the hurricane? And no, the answer to that is no, the paper surveys were made available by um, the Assistant Secretary uh, for Preparedness and Response uh, Incident uh, Response Coordination Team. They had paper surveys already. Um, actually, there was no system really uh, through, um, through uh, the, the group that we were working with to collect data electronically. Other agencies during the response did have, in particular, I'm thinking of uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. They had a some type of uh, tablet-based system to uh, monitor for damage and actually uh, take pictures and, and upload it, but it was a proprietary system. So the answer is we were given paper surveys and we had to use those initially. Um, the second question is, I see here it says, uh, is the paper version information scannable or does it need manual entry into survey one, two, three? And as far as I know, with the Esri software, you, you can't really scan it because what you're doing is you're creating a modular uh, version of the paper form in an electronic format that allows for drop down menus, uh, filters for questions and things like that. So it's actually almost like a it's, it's a much, much better uh, than a paper version because you can actually it's very compact. So you can see the entire survey on one page. And then you can click the little arrows and it drops down the different uh, blocks of survey questions. Like there might be a block for power status, another block for uh, generator status, another block for water or communication status. So it makes for a very compact electronic form that accurately, accurately represents what's on the uh, paper form. The next question I see here is, um, ArcGIS, where to get the training? And there is training available. So first of all, if you have a license through your organization. Um, you can request one. Oftentimes licenses are provided. CDC does that. They provide licenses to pretty much anybody who would like one. You can get training through um, your licenses access to uh, what's called Esri University, and they have a lot of beginning training courses and things like that. There's also some free training online. If you Google Survey123 or Workforce, there's there are people out there that uh, 
uh, that are actually providing training through YouTube videos and things like that. And I think, uh, Kelsey, there's GitHub, I think, as well. There's some trainings available through links in there. I don't know if you have any other um, resources that you've been using as well. but. Um. I think that covers it. I can say that I really didn't know how to use Survey123 when we first started it. None of us did. And it, took, it just took maybe for some more complex coding, which isn't very common, maybe a couple months, but it's very user-friendly. Um, and there's so many free trainings, as Chris mentioned, on the um, Esri, I guess, university website uh, that it's, it can be picked up pretty quickly. Okay, and I see that there's a somebody mentioned there's questions in the Q and A box, which I just noticed. So, would using a fillable uh, PDF form or online SharePoint form to gather information during the field surveys have been possible? Um, and Kelsey, you can you can look at this answers as well. But I think it would have been. There are other types of systems that are usable in the field. There's RedCap. Uh, SharePoint, I believe we tested that in the field at an exposure assessment in Washington State where they used uh, Microsoft Forms and an and a activated Excel spreadsheet. So there are different uh, possibilities. Kelsey, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Uh, yeah, there's definitely different possibilities. I've used a few in the field and I don't think that they work as well as Survey123. They tended to be a bit buggy, especially if you're considered offline and you don't have any service. Um, and then the one thing that's good about using Survey123 or a GIS enabled software is most of the time there is a GIS unit for a response and they're collecting data. So if you can easily transfer your data to that and be able to show it visually, uh, that's something that leadership really wants to know or people that are moving around patients or supplies. Um, I think it just stream, streamlines things a bit. Um, and Use and I would I would say it's a seamless all-in-one um, you know GIS um, web GIS package that allows you to build these tools fairly quickly and fairly efficiently. If you use these other systems like RedCap, they require they have different modules, and you have to create the programming to connect the modules yourself. It's not difficult, but you have to use something called Open Data Kit, and you have to use either Python programming or other programming languages. So if it ever breaks and you're not the person who wrote that programming, you could be, <laughs> you could be in trouble. So, so this way it's like a, it's provided as a turnkey system, if you will, by Esri. Um, another question here is how long did it take to develop the application and what software or programs were used? And so the initial, and I'll let Kelsey add to this because there are several different tools that Esri provides, but the initial development in the field required uh, Three things. One was uh, Survey123 Connect, which allows you to take the paper form and, and essentially create it by using what's called Excel, XLS, Excel programming language. Then you can make the form and create all the different filters, the drop down boxes, and that sort of thing. And the application itself is the Survey123 application, which can be downloaded to your phone for free, your tablet for free, or to your laptop for free. And then, Kelsey, there are other applications um, if you want to go into those. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> anyway, there are a lot of different things. There's work, work. Uh, there's operations dashboard, which allows you to take the Excel spreadsheet with the data that was collected from the field assessments, and then build uh, a, a dashboard that looks at the specific pieces of data that you want to represent as numbers, graphs, uh, pie charts, whatever. So, um, there's another question here: the vaccine form, Kelsey. This is for you. What program software? Or was the form was the form in, or was it on a website? What program is the database in? Is it SharePoint or something else? So, um, we actually just helped develop the tool. So the way it works with the state health departments, especially for COVID, um, was we helped develop the surveys, created some dashboards, and then really handed off all the tools to. Um, ASPR and the Puerto Rico Department of Health. So we didn't see really where the data was being held or had access to the data after that. Um, I don't think it was on a SharePoint if that helps. And the form I don't believe was publicly available or published anywhere. Right, that's right. Did, did I answer all of that or Chris, do you wanna add? No, you did, you did, yeah. And it's basically, it, the data is held on an Excel spreadsheet which you can download um, and, and keep on your computer that sort of thing. So, and again, 
uh, during the response, the, uh, the servers were Esri servers that obviously were operating and that's where we held the data. We pulled it off the database and used it uh, either to hand over to uh, the Joint Operations Center, Fusion Center or, or things like that. But um, there's another question here. Um, was, will the rapid assessment forms be able to be filled out by voice? And I think, yes, there's a way to, to actually speak into your tablet. Uh, you have to activate, I think it's, uh, I think it's Android. It's an Android voice feature and it will work actually. We didn't actually use it a lot, but we tested it a little bit. You can actually um, do that. Kelsey, I don't know if you want to. We add. did. Yeah, we did test it on Android devices, my iPhone. I think it just depends on how well you speak with the voice feature. Um, you know, sometimes it can be a little clunky, but I think if you're taking detailed notes in the field um, or if you're on the phone calling a facility, it's definitely helpful to use the voice feature. Just be prepared that it might um, uh, read, it might display some words a little bit differently than what you actually said. <laughs> and then I, um, I am happy somebody asked this question. Someone asks, uh, Tim asks, am I, I am concerned about the risk of technology failure during disasters, which is always a possibility, um, such as no electricity, internet, cell signal, et cetera. How would this be mitigated? And just to answer that, uh, basically, so you're, you're not, when you collect the information on a tablet, an electronic form, uh, the information isn't sent up to the cloud and then deleted from the tablet. It remains on the tablet until you connect to the internet. So you can use a cell phone data connected tablet, or you can just get back to your, you know, your base of operations where you do have an internet connection. And there in a matter of, you know, a few minutes, you can upload all of the data that was collected in the field that day from each tablet. And we've tested that many times and it works very well. Um, if you drop the tablet in, in water, <laughs> that's a different story, and that can happen. But we've we've also had issues with paper forms as well. Um, you know, people leaving them on top of the car and driving away and having to go back and get them. So there's all kinds of possibilities. But the the reason for this is essentially that you have um, hard data on the tablet, and then if it's a cell, it's a cell enabled um, tablet. It goes and is replicated on the cloud as well. So you have two copies of it. So I hope that answers that question. Um, now, we are going back to the, um, the chat box and we have, um, let's see, how do we request, um, let's see, did you put the websites back on the screen? Oh, um, somebody asked if we could put, Kelsey, if you could put the websites, I guess, back on the screen so that they can take a look at them, I guess that would be great. Um, and then, uh, let's see, someone asked, how do we request assistance from the CDC field team or the CDART team? So they can send us an email, right? Through our CDART email address. Yeah, we have, I should have put that on here and I totally forgot. We do have a generic CDART email address, but you can also just email myself or Chris. And I think yeah. our emails are included on the invite. <laughs> exactly. And, and the idea being is that if, if we do create a, like sort of a CDART you know, field deployable team, eventually, as Kelsey mentioned, that it would be you know, by request from agencies that are involved in the response, right? So. Um, and then we have another question here, which is, what is the cost of a of a uh, an ArcGIS online license? So, Kelsey, I don't know if you you you've kind of been dealing with that for our team for C Carrot. Um, it depends on the organization, right? It does. Um, I'm sure they have their. I don't know offhand, honestly. The um, exact cost of one license. I know it needs to be renewed every year, maybe around a thousand. Um, but it, oh, can you still hear me? Yes. Oh, my video cut out. Sorry. Um, uh, or my connection to the median, I guess, cut out. Uh, but they offer a variety of types. I think, um, if you want there's there's types just for people in the field that need their own login like they're not doing any we lost kelsey we lost your audio we lost your <laughs> <laughs> we can see you but we can't hear you she's i think she's on well what she was saying is it, there's a different types of licenses and it's based on your organization you can 
purchase a license, but they're very, fairly expensive. So you would have to go through your organization, um, depending on where you work and ask them if they would provide that to you. There's another way to look to work with GIS inexpensively, and that's to use QGIS or another open source GIS um, platform. QGIS is easily downloadable and there are lots of free um, informational sessions on YouTube and elsewhere on the internet. And it's the files are interchangeable with Esri. One other question here is, can you speak to the GoKits um, uh, that include the tablets used in CDAR? We self-funded those um, because when we were developing, so we had FEMA, FEMA tablets during the response, but in the uh, recovery section, we didn't have any way to get tablets. So we self-funded those and we created those little GoKits with Pelican cases. So they're basic tablets that you can get at Costco and they, they run fine. They operate uh, fine for the, the purposes of the application. Kelsey, I don't know, could we hear you now? <laughs> and then finally, this is a, oh, there's a lot of questions here. Um, these are the questions in the chat box may be for you guys. Will we have access to this recording and so forth? So you may have to answer those, but so. Yes. Yes, it will. And I also dropped in a, a link in the chat for folks that are here of that uh, page that Kelsey had up on the screen. So folks are looking for that as well. To answer those questions in the chat box, the webinar will be available on the NEHA website, www.neha.org. One continuing education uh, credit is available. Participants can submit this one hour of continuing education just by logging into their My NEHA account. So that would be just as you normally do. Other questions? Feel free. I'm not really seeing any others in the chat as they're coming in or the Q&A box. That was a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great webinar. Kai, we're gonna turn this back over to you for a few final comments and then we'll wrap this up. Yeah, thank you so much to our speakers. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's great to see how this, this has progressed from its beginnings uh, at Hurricane Maria response. To, to where it is now, really appreciate it and really appreciate everyone's attendance at this first quarterly webinar for NEHA Preparedness. Thank you very much. And on behalf of NEHA, we wanna say thank you so much to our speakers, Chris Poulet and to uh, Kelsey Brady, definitely to Kai Elgathun and all the members of the NEHA Preparedness Committee who are so valuable in bringing this forward to folks, please watch your email and our website for information on the next webinar from the Preparedness Committee. And as always, we at NEHA wanna to say to you, thank you so much for all that you do for environmental health back within your communities and your world, because you are what makes this worthwhile. Thank you so much. Everyone have a great rest of your day.